uh, Dr. Warren, can you hear me? I can. I am here. Good to see you. Yeah, good morning. Nice to see you. Now, did you, was somebody else, was, were you having uh, Nathan join us as well, or is he, is he here? I don't uh, know if I see him. No, no. I'll, I'm just here today. He'll do a separate thing. Um, I specialize in thyroid, thyroid hormones, healing after thyroidectomy, which he knows okay. some about, but not as much. So, yep, no, just me here today. I'm, I'm, I'm always up for learning more. So awesome, well, wonderful. Thank you. Can you give us a, a little, just, just to let, let you know here, we've got, you know, however many 30, 50 people show up in this and then they have a chance to ask questions. You guys are watching on YouTube. If you, if you come on over to Rivera.health, you can, you can come in and ask questions as well. Um, so, but they're all muted, so they won't be able to say anything. So we don't have a lot of background feedback noise. So you and I'll have a little chat and uh, we'll go from there. But first of all, if you don't mind, uh, well, first of all, again, thank you for being here, but let us know a little bit about you, who you are and your background, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm a doctor of chiropractic. I'm a functional wellness practitioner. Um, but the reason I got here is pain to purpose. It was in my own health uh, story. You know, when I was 16 years old, I... I uh, was walking out of a movie theater and I thought I was having a heart attack. I had this ridiculous amount of severe pain, like in my chest. I got rushed to the emergency room. I get there and at 16, I find out that I have, like the doctor came in and he's like, oh, there's like a thousand gallstones in, in your gallbladder. And it never made sense to me that at 16 years old, that happens to me, right? Um, but, you know, it's easy to take care of, right? They cut out this organ and they send you on your way. But I can, you know, I, I usually, when I do these talks, I have people raise their hand, how many people have been diagnosed with a thyroid issue or how many people uh, think they have a thyroid issue, but also have a history of gallbladder issues or have had their gallbladder removed, right? There's that connection there, but no one told me that. I went in to see my doctor after I had my gallbladder removed and I asked them like, you know, I feel like I need to lose weight. Like I, I feel like, cause that's what I thought health was, right? And the doctor was like, you know, I'll, I'll help you. He checked me out. And at the end of my meeting, he stepped out and got me a Xerox copied uh, of a food pyramid. Food pyramid, you know, the grains at the bottom and two paragraphs at the bottom and gave me the sheet. And I'm aging myself there by saying Xerox copy, right? But, and he sent me on my way. And then three years later, I'm driving. My mom notices this huge lump in my neck. And I, you know, go, I get all these tests done. And I find out I had thyroid cancer. I'll never forget sitting in that doctor's office and hearing your daughter has cancer. It was an out-of-body experience. But the doctor then said, oh, you know, but the good news is if there's a cancer to have, this is the good one, right? Why is it? Because within medicine, we think that the thyroid is so easy to take care of because we can either cut it out and put you on a pill for the rest of your life or just medicate you with a pill. You don't have to do anything else, but just get on a pill. And that's what, what happened with me. I got on a pill. I got high dose radiation, all for a type of cancer where that was completely unnecessary. And I always mention that because, uh, you know, this follicular variant papillary carcinoma, it's increasing every single year exponentially in women. And the same things that cause your thyroid to become dysfunctional leads to this. But what ended up happening is I ended up becoming weight loss resistant. I started suffering with depression. Like every day I would wake up with this heaviness I couldn't shake. And then at night when it was time for me to sleep, I was fixated um, and anxious and worried. But the problem was every time I would go in to see my doctor, they would tell me that my labs, my thyroid labs look normal. In fact, one time I was doing CrossFit, I was working out four days a week. And then I decided to become vegan because for some reason, you know, when you think you want to get healthy, you got to be vegan, right? And, and I went into this doctor and the doctor looked at me and was like, do you understand calories in, calories out? So I wasn't losing weight. I wasn't feeling well. And my doctor was telling me it's because I was eating too much. And then I became raw vegan. I literally punished my body because of the misunderstanding of my labs, of my, the incompleteness of my labs. And it wasn't until I went, I got into a car accident. I went to a doctor, chiropractic office, and they taught me for the first time that ever that my body's created to heal itself. So at 19, I drew a line in the sand and I was like, no doctor is going to know more about me. I fired my doctor. I took health into my own hand and I go, I'm all in. So at that point, I changed my career path and I went to school so that I could help people transform their health the same way I did. Well, that's quite a, quite a story. And sorry you had to go through that. But I mean, I think it sounds like you came out the other side, uh, you know, better and you're going to help other people, you know. 
I mean, and, and that's what I recall from, from, you know, when I was studying cancer in, in school. I, I wasn't an oncologist, so I didn't really have much to treat it, but thyroid cancer is one of the ones where the mortality is pretty low. And, and, and yes, you can, you can manage it with, with replacement. The other thing, you know, the gallbladder, which you kind of uh, addressed, that has become so incredibly common. I mean, it's like when I was actively practicing surgery, I mean, the, the general surgeon in the next room was, he was going through three or four gallbladders a day, every day. It just seems like there's an unlimited supply of people that need to that get their gallbladders out, whether they, you know, whether they truly need it out or not is, is, is somewhat debatable. If there's other things to do to, invent it, to, to avoid it. Um, so you, I guess you have, you still, you have a thyroid that's in place, but it's been radiated or has it or you had a thyroidectomy? Cut, cut out completely and radiation. Okay. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about, you said incomplete labs and why, why do you feel, I guess this is just an important preload to this, if, you know, follicular, papillary follicular thyroid cancer uh, is, is increasing. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Well, you know, it's really interesting, and I always butcher his name, and I can send a link after this is done on the work that he's done. So I call him actually Dr. Yuri. Um, a couple, well, I think it was 2015, he kind of brought together this international community, community of pathologists and radiologists and doctors to reclassify the name of this follicular variant papillary carcinoma, because he's saying like, wait a minute, look at the data, what we're doing by cutting out these thyroids or radiating these thyroid is completely unnecessary. But one really remarkable thing is that he's looked at the gene changes that happen. And so the gene for, more, for the more aggressive type of thyroid cancer hasn't really increased exponentially. It's the one that just creates benign tumors. It's the ones that just are causing these thyroid growth that are increasing every single year. And from his study, he's interviewed us saying, this is an environmental carcinogenic effect. There's something in our environment that's causing this one type of gene that doesn't lead to aggressive types of cancers to change. And it's an interesting conversation when he talks about how this isn't aggressive, because when you end up in a doctor's office, the first topic of conversation is cutting it out. In fact, even if it's inconclusive, it's still a just in case approach. Let's just go ahead and cut it out, which I think is, I, I get the mortality is low, but this is such a vital dynamic adaptive organ that we need. So this idea of let's just cut it out. Oh, there was no cancer there. Well, at least, you know, you know, better safe than sorry. It's not just about dying. It's about quality of life. And we have no long-term studies about how our bodies are adapting without this organ or what our bodies will need 10, 50, 20, 30 years down the road when you're living without an organ like this. Yeah. And your point about, you know, the thyroid, I mean, obviously when you try to replace, you are never going to get it right. I mean, the thyroid is adapted to the local environment and it's going to, it's going to change just like any other organ. It's very smart and it responds to all these stimuli. And the best you can do is kind of a, you know, a fairly poor approximate approximation with replacement. Same thing with insulin. With diabetics, they struggle mm -hmm. to get that right. But and, and that's another thing. The thyroid hormone has tremendous impacts among all kinds of things. You know, there's some concern about diabetes and thyroid. There's, there's a link with that. You know, if your thyroid's not functioning, then you are at higher risk for diabetic issues. And so, what are your thoughts on? Uh, the thyroid beyond just, you know, what it's, it has an impact throughout the body. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And the one thing I want to point out that you said that I think it's really important for people to hear that you just said, it's difficult to pinpoint, like kind of like to dose it according, um, like insulin, like, you know, according to your external stressors, according to what your body needs. I think it's important to note that. Because when you go into your doctor and there's this, this dysfunctional thyroid, the most common thing that happens is you get on a thyroid medication and I'll have people on the same dose for 10 years. And they notice that they don't feel well or something's off, but they're on the same dose. And it's like, how can you be on the same dose, you know, for that long? That's not, uh, that's not right. Like this is an adaptive thing. Now, going back um, to what you said about these thyroid symptoms. So the biggest thing to understand about the thyroid, and I think it can be really difficult because when you think you have a thyroid issue, you go to an endocrinologist and what they're going to focus in on is that thyroid and then the thyroid hormone, 
but they're not going to look on how that hormone is affecting everything else in your body. And active thyroid, which is T3, works on the mitochondria. It works on energy production, ATP production for almost all of your cells. So most people think that, you know, low thyroid symptoms are going to be just, I can't lose weight or my hair's falling out. No, it can be a wide range of symptoms. In, in fact, I came across a study that only 10% of hypothyroid people have overt symptoms, meaning my hair is falling out, my eyebrows are changing, I'm weight loss resistant. The other 90% are suffering with depression and anxiety, affects brain function, constipation, diarrhea, skin issues, feeling off in their bodies that they just can't pinpoint um, having low immune function, diabetes, insulin resistant. I had a woman come in whose diet is just clean and good and she's a keto, but she can't go you know, deep into ketosis and her glucose stays around in the upper 90s. And she's feeling like she has to change all her food and restrict her food when her thyroid was suboptimal, not even out of the range because it was on the low end of the range. She was starting to develop this insulin resistance. So those symptoms, what you have to realize is that T3, gallbladder function, that T3 moves everything forward and allows everything to do what it needs to do. When it's suboptimal, everything can slow down when it comes to hypothyroidism. Yeah, and so just back to the, the, the question about why do you think the frequency of this, this is happening more? In regards to hypothyroidism? Well, I guess that, and then also this cancer that you said was increasing dramatically. I think, so I think it's toxicity. So when we're looking at the thyroid, I always like to explain, especially, and we'll get to the labs here. You know, I always like to explain the labs according to top down. And what we have to remember is that the hypothalamus, which communicates to the pituitary is going to communicate to the thyroid. And the hypothalamus is influenced by any type of stressor, chemical, emotional, and physical stressor. So number one, chronic stressors in our environment. We're walking into rooms with fragrances. We're being exposed. We know this. So we know that the thyroid loves iodine. It utilizes iodine. Iodine molecules is what the four, T when we look at thyroid hormones, there's T4 those four molecules come from iodine, the T3, those three molecules come from iodine. But we know that iodine is a halogen. So the same kind of molecules that look like iodine, your thyroid's gonna bind to. And what are some other halogens? Fluoride, chlorine, bromine. Not only that, but most people only think that they're getting fluoride and chlorine from what? From water, which you're right. You're getting a lot, there's a lot of cities that are putting in these you know, chemicals into your water and you're getting them in amounts that you shouldn't. But what we're not taking into consideration is that we're also getting polychlorinated and polyfluorinated chemicals from flame retardants on our couches, on our beds, on nonstick surfaces like your Teflon pans or food packaging. So listen, it, it sounds like overwhelming, right? Like, oh my gosh, I can't get rid of all of this. The goal isn't to live in a bubble. The goal is to decrease your exposure where you can and then detox at a cellular level. The other thing I want to mention too, which we do know, we've known this for a while, is that heavy metals cause cell growth, um, cause tumors to show up on the thyroid. We know that selenium is also an essential mineral that is involved in the creation of thyroid hormones and the conversion of thyroid hormones. And selenium has these metal properties as well. So again, your thyroid can bind up to things, especially like mercury and cadmium. Um, and where do we get a lot of that from? You know, the fillings in our teeth, what we're exposed to in our mouth and in our dental procedures. So the biggest problem is this, is that within this medical system, we think we've got it all figured out, right? When it comes to the thyroid, you got a thyroid issue, what we're gonna give you is hormones, which can be really life-changing. If you're completely depleted, you will lose weight, you'll feel different. But the problem is, is that medication's at the end. It's the end product. And so all the underlying things that are causing that thyroid to become dysfunctional, not only will continue to shut down your thyroid, but will always cause other systemic issues as well. So the truth is, we're allowing those problems to persist while we feel better because we're taking a hormone, we're taking the end product. 
Hashimoto's, which is 90% of hypothyroid individuals, is a whole, bottom, whole body immune issue. You go to your doctor, if you have Hashimoto's, if you have those antibodies, the answer is still the same. Synthroid or Armour Thyroid, there's no medication on the market right now that's going to bring down your antibodies so it doesn't get addressed. So we know that these antibodies cross the blood-brain barrier, they affect your brain, they increase your chances of all other autoimmune issues. So here you are feeling better as your thyroids continue to get sicker and sicker, increasing your chances of thyroid cancer as well as other systemic issues as well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, Hashimoto's is something that, you know, again, I obviously we have a, a community that's kind of focused around diet and we've seen uh, quite a bit of success with regard to that particular issue. But how do you, uh, how do I mean, again, many physicians, you know, thyroid workup is a TSH and a T3, T4, and, and that that's kind of it. You know, sometimes they'll throw, you know, the ant antibodies in there if, if they're going beyond that. But what, what things are people missing when they're, when they're discussing the thyroid, when they're working it up? Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I'm going to explain this kind of from the top down. And I also want you to realize that your thyroid, and if you don't have a thyroid and how much medication you need, is going to be dependent on if you're efficiently creating energy, if you have weight to lose, if you're in ketosis, if you're low a carb, and that's something we don't talk about where, where you're at in your menstrual cycle, it'll affect what your values show up on your labs, right? And so I'll give you some variations when I'm looking at those ranges. So number one, you know, hypothalamus talks to the pituitary and from the pituitary, you release TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. This used, to, this used to be the gold standard. They said, that's all you needed to be tested. In fact, I've been looking at the studies for a decade and a half and I'll never forget coming across studies when I was really suffering and in the studies, they'd be like, if a patient, if someone is saying that they don't feel well and their TSH looks good, then you need to evaluate. They're either lying, they're not following your recommendations, they're not taking their medication the right way like you told them. It was on us and the patient. But now we're saying like, wait a minute, no, there's more to this. And this is why. So TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is a pituitary hormone. It is not a thyroid hormone. It will tell you what the pituitary is sensing. The pituitary, there's this feedback loop. That's what doctors would depend on for a really long time. Like, okay, well, if you need thyroid hormone, it'll affect your TSH. No, it'll only, in that feedback, feedback loop, we're only looking at T4. It's not looking at T3. And I'll explain why that's really important to understand, right? So it's thyroid stimulating hormone. The ranges can go from 0.5 to 4.5. But we have studies now showing that it has to be under a 2.5. We have studies showing it increases your chances of like chronic fatigue syndrome, um, feeling down, having uh, you know, these subclinical thyroid symptoms, increasing your chances of miscarrying if your TSH is above a 2.5. So you can go to your doctor, you're a four, you're a 3.5, and that's not enough. But we can also see that TSH start to increase when you're chronically stressed. And that's how TSH that's how it should be utilized as this kind of marker that you can see how you're changing with your environment, but it's not going to always be accurate to tell you if there's something wrong downstream. So TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, comes from the thyroid, uh, well, comes from the pituitary, goes to the thyroid, and from the thyroid, you're going to produce T4, right? But total T4 is not going to be helpful. You don't want to know it's unbound. You, wanna, uh, you don't want to know it's bound up. You want to know what's unbound and readily available. You can have all of this T4 that's bound up with nothing to use. What good is that to you? What you want to know is what's readily available. And that's the free version of T4. Now, T4 still needs to be activated. It needs to be converted into its active form. So right now, more of these progressive doctors will say, okay, we're going to do TSH and free T4. Why is that? because they're just under the assumption that your liver, your kidneys, your gut is just going to convert it. They don't, and especially the number one medication um, on the market for thyroid is Synthroid, which is a T4 only medication. So really what they're concerned about is, do you have any T4? Can I change this thyroid medication? Um, and that's all they look at, but that's not what's going to bind to the cell. 
what needs to bind to the cell in order to create all of this amazing, you know, changes within your body, your metabolism, your energy, all of that has to be T4 converted into free T3. So that T4 is going to go to the liver, it's going to go to the gut, it's going to go to the kidney. And I'm going to go ahead and say this, it, it's kind of a vicious cycle when it comes to T4 and conversion, because if you're suboptimal, and mind you, I say suboptimal because I'm not talking about just out of the range. You can be on the low end of the range. You can be in the middle end of, uh, middle of the range and still have thyroid symptoms because that's not where you should be. But it's this vicious cycle because if your thyroid is suboptimal, it affects digestion, absorption, HCL production. And if those things are affected, then that affects your ability to convert it convert your thyroid hormones. And if that affects your ability to convert your thyroid hormones, it'll affect your digestion. So it creates this kind of vicious cycle. And I say that because when I sit across from people or I do like virtual consults and I'm like, you're on T4 only medication, your doctor's never checked free T3. How well is your digestion? Oh, I have constipation or I have diarrhea, I have acid reflux. How well do you think your liver's functioning? Well, not well, I'm having some blood sugar issues. Well, how can we depend on your liver, your gut, and your kidneys to convert this when you already having symptoms that they're not efficient. So T4 goes into the liver, the kidneys, gut, gets converted to free T3, and that's what binds to the cell. There is, and so free T3, let me go ahead and tell you about this. I like to keep it within a range. Within the medical, you know, like within the literature for the longest time, the, the range was too broad. There would be people, so it could be between 2.4 and 4.4. And if you're at 2.5, you're still fine. No, you got to pay attention to your symptoms. You got to pay attention to how your body's functioning. So I like to keep it within a range because if you're not low carb, if you're not in ketosis, like you can, you, your range should be higher, right? It should be 3.5 or higher. But in the absence of carbs, in the absence, or if you start losing weight, um, if your body becomes more efficient with energy, if you're producing ketone bodies, there's less need for conversion of T4 to T3. And that's really important because there's some blogs out there. There's some things out there that are like, oh, you have to eat carbs. You have to eat carbs because that's what's going to convert T4 to T3. No, studies find that T4 to T3 goes down. It doesn't say why it happens. They're only telling you what happens. But when we look at other studies that look at people that are losing weight, that are looking at people that are reversing, you know, neurological things um, when they get into ketosis, when we look at other studies with people that are obese and losing weight and becoming better health-wise, we also see a decrease of T4 to T3 conversion. Because T3, you will need more T3 when your body is not efficient. You will need more T3 when your body is consuming tons and tons of carbs, right? Um, chronically, you will need T3 when you have all this weight that your body's holding on to. And then when you see that change, you see less need for it. So that's why I can see people that are either carnivore or low carb, um, high fat or high protein, I'll see them at a three or a 2.9 and still see amazing metabolic changes, still see weight loss, still see increase of energy. So free T3 can be a range. I just don't, the one thing, whether you're low carb or, you know, carnivore or keto, whatever it may be, the only thing is you don't just, you don't want to be on the low end of the range. You don't want to be at that 2.5, 2.6, 2.7. You want to be a little bit higher than that. And then allow that range to occur according to where you're at with how you're eating. Now, the next test is reverse T3. Reverse T3 is a um, marker of stress. It's a marker that your body makes to prepare for stress or in response to stress. And if you're in stress, it'll use it. So what ends up happening is when you have free T3 that goes to the liver, it's going to make some, some of what's called reverse T3. And the idea is this innate thing your body does to prepare itself if it needs to be into survival mode, right? If we are in a famine, if there's lack of food, if for some reason you need to conserve energy and your thyroid cannot function, you have reverse T3 to back it up. But what that means is that if you're chronically stressed and stress is emotional, chemical, or physical stressors, if you're stressed, your body's like, wait, this isn't, this isn't good. If you're inflamed, if you're toxic, right? If your gut 
you have gut infections, reactivation, whatever it may be, what your body's going to start doing is it's going to start taking from free T3 and increase reverse T3. And this can be problematic because reverse T3 is a molecule that looks like free T3, which means it can bind to the cell. It'll bind to the cell, but it won't do all the amazing things that free T3 will do. So is it possible that your TSH looks good on your labs? Your free T4 looks good. Your free T3 is on the lower end of the range, but you have so much reverse T3 in your body that you feel hypothyroid, that you have these symptoms of hypothyroidism. Absolutely. You have all this reverse T3. Reverse T3 is a really good marker to look at as well because you can catch an underlying thyroid issue before your thyroid gland crashes, okay? So why that is, is because when that reverse T3 goes up, and as your thyroid starts to shut down, you have all this high reverse T3, reverse T3, your body will start using that reverse T3. So even though your thyroid is shutting down, you feel okay. Like you don't feel horrible. You're getting up, you're doing what you need to do, but you don't realize that you're depleting this backup storage that you have. Once that's depleted, reverse T3 is low. Then you see free T3 low, and then you are just fatigued to the max. And that's why reverse T3 is really, really important. And then the last two tests are TPO antibodies, thyroglobulin antibodies. And just, you know, reverse T3, I usually like to see it mid-range and down. You don't want it to see it on the upper end of the range. That's a big red flag that something's happening there. And then TPO antibodies, you want it under a nine. Thyroglobulin antibodies, you want it under a one. Again, there's no drug that you can take for it. You have to figure out what your autoimmune trigger is. You can start in the gut and then go deeper from there, looking at detoxification, mold, Lyme, underlying infections, but you have to address if you have antibodies, you can't just keep an eye on it every year. You have to address this autoimmune reaction because it will always lead to more issues. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> it was very helpful. Thank you for doing that. I know a lot of people are asking about the reverse T3, so I'm glad you touched on that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at the, you know, you got some lab values behind you on, on the, on the, on oh. the whiteboard, homocysteine, vitamin D. Yeah. Do you want to touch on the relevance of any of those things as, as, as they pertain? Yeah, absolutely. Look at that. Okay. So TSH, free T4, free T3, thyroid level. So homocysteine, we like to look at homocysteine because it's a marker for methylation. We need proper methylation in order to have proper um, thyroid hormone levels. We also like methylation, adequate methylation in order to support your body's natural detox process to keep your sex hormones in check for both men and women to get rid of estrogen so you don't have estrogen dominance. So usually when we're looking at homocysteine numbers, we're looking at keeping it around a seven or under um, to support methylation. The next thing we have, vitamin D is a hormone D. Guys, if you have not had your vitamin D tested, you need to get your vitamin D tested. And that needs to be a normal part of your lab work every year or every six months, whenever you get lab work done, because vitamin D, it's no longer, I can tell you this, and I, I've spoke, spoken with my colleagues about this, because I'm like, it's not just about not getting outside, which you do need to get outside. You need to get sunshine. You need to get sunlight, help your circadian rhythm, help make hormone D. But the insulin and blood sugar issue affects your hormone D levels. You know, toxicity affects your hormone D levels. Your liver affects your hormone D levels. And so when it acts as a hormone, vitamin D helps with the T4, T3 conversion and the production of T4, right? But the thing is this, the range is from 30 to 100. I will say this, I have not seen such low vitamin Ds in all my years of practice until the last couple of years within the 20s. The goal is when I'm looking at thyroid healing and support to have it above a 60, that's where you want it to be. So we always check vitamin D. It's a hormone, it affects your immune system, it's essential for your sex hormones, your thyroid hormones, your adrenals, you need it. It is involved in so many different processes. But I will say this just kind of as a side note, you need the adequate cofactors with vitamin D3 if you're gonna supplement with it, right? There's other ways to naturally increase it like with light and stuff, um, but magnesium shuttles vitamin D into the cell, vitamin K at a minimum, because vitamin D will move calcium K is what allows calcium to go where it needs to go and not settle in other areas. So what do we have here? Fasting insulin. And I would actually add C peptides to this. Um, I look at insulin as well as triglycerides and A1C and CBC. Those are the best markers 
not just for heart health, as well as C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is an inflammatory marker, especially when it comes to the heart, but it's a very good uh, marker to look at with inflammation. But I always keep an eye on blood sugar. So like was mentioned earlier, thyroid, when you're suboptimal with your thyroid hormones, studies have found this interesting thing. If you have low thyroid hormones, remember when I say suboptimal, I'm not talking about out of the range. I'm talking about you can be at a 2.9 and that's suboptimal for you. What they found is that that body will, your body will become, can become hypoglycemic. Oh my gosh, you don't have enough. But then at the peripheral level, like your tissue level, uh, you're insulin resistant. So you don't have enough and you're not going to utilize the glucose that you are exposed to. Like, so you have this insulin resistant and hypoglycemic um, issue together in the body. So keeping an eye on that, like, this is what I say, like when your thyroid is off, it affects a lot of different things and it makes you feel like the work that you're doing isn't working, right? The way that you're eating, the way that you're moving, you just get frustrated and you start, you know, restricting calories. You start chronically fasting. You start chronically working out for an underlying hormone issue. You don't understand why your blood sugar is not where it needs to be when all you need to do is address this underlying hormone issue when it comes to the thyroid. Now, iron and ferritin, I wanna talk about that because there is this big connection with iron and ferritin um, and the thyroid. And so I mentioned before that when your thyroid hormones are suboptimal, you will decrease HCL production, you can decrease bile production. So you don't absorb and digest food efficiently. So I tend to see low iron and then low ferritin which sucks because low iron and low ferritin, we're having decrease of oxygen to tissues that need it, which the same symptoms you feel when you're hypothyroid, you will feel when you have low iron or low ferritin. So the, the goal is that both ferritin and iron should be above 100, right? A little bit higher for women, especially if they're menstruating. But once that iron and ferritin go down, you're gonna have symptoms. And I like checking iron and ferritin as well is because there's a lot of people that are under this impression that they can't eat meat. Like I have a lot of people that come in and they're like, I, I just can't eat meat. Like I just, uh, you know, I have these issues, I have this bloating and all of this. It's because your pancreatic enzymes are low. It's because your stomach acid is low. It's because your bile is low. So this idea that like you have this difficulty with meat and protein has more to do with your digestive capacity than you really having an issue with that. And if you notice some digestive issues when you eat meat, that underlying gut needs to be addressed. And then, and then free and total testosterone, looking at um, adrenal function, I use that as kind of like drive and adrenal function. So um, that's, that's everything that was up here. Uh, that's going further into the lab work here. Yeah, I, I know, I just back to the little car, I know Stephen Finney has written uh, a little bit about uh, thyroid sensitivity, you know, and a low carb diet and, 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 you know, like, just like we have insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity, we have sensitivity to, to really all the hormones, you know, whether it's androgen sensitivity or insensitivity. And so that uh, perhaps a low carbohydrate diet in some cases improves thyroid sensitivity perhaps is, uh, I don't know if you've ever delved into that or consider that. Um, somebody's asking about fasting and you mentioned about fasting and over-exercising. Does fasting have a role in thyroid health, good or bad? Is it conditional? And if so, can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I did want to touch really quick about this uh, thyroid sensitivity. I do see, I do see a change. Like when you when you go low carb, there, again, there's less need for it. But I also see cell membrane sensitivity, as you were talking, like with insulin and blood sugar. I see cell membrane sensitivity, and I want to note this because a lot of times there'll be people that are on thyroid medication and they think um, that the dose they're on is what their body needs. When in actuality, they have increased their dose because they're not absorbing and binding what they're utilizing. And so I have individuals that will do carnivore, get into ketosis and fasting, and they start to feel hyper symptoms and they think, oh my gosh, I have hyperthyroid. No, hyperthyroid is a disease process. But what ends up happening when you change your metabolism and your body becomes more efficient um, at you know, creating energy and losing weight and all of this, 
what you find is that you actually didn't need all that dosing and now it's too much for you. And so people cut it and I have people that even have flex days and they might go back to increasing carbs that still don't need to increase their thyroid medication because of the sensitivity that has changed in regards to what they're utilizing. Now, fasting. Fasting can be an amazing tool. I'm going to kind of separate it in two different ways. There's intermittent fasting, and then there's more like dinner to dinner fast and longer, like 24 hour fast and longer. Intermittent fasting is going to be a powerful tool. We know that depending on how long you go, we can start to see signs of autophagy, cell membrane sensitivity. But I also love intermittent fasting for supporting the circadian rhythm and supporting adrenals. The one thing that you have to understand is that you're walking around, some of you guys are walking around in a hypothyroid state, right? Where you don't have enough energy. But what you don't realize is the only reason you're able to wake up in the morning, go to work, deal with the kids, deal with everything, is because you have cortisol, you have adrenals that come into play. And so you're kind of functioning from a survival state because your body's like, what the heck's going on? We don't have this. We're going to produce cortisol to make up for that. So one thing I was to take into consideration is that sex hormones, thyroid hormones, and adrenal hormones all affect each other. I like to say it's a three-legged stool where if one of them, if I kick one of the legs off, everything else is going to fall. So when you're utilizing intermittent fasting, I always teach it as it's not caloric restriction, it's time-restricted eating. We have a circadian clock, not only in our brain, but with all of our organs. In our body, in order to prepare for sleep, we need to eat at the same certain time every single day and not eat too late because we just, over time with all the snacking um, that they told us that we needed five to six meals a day and snacking at night and these blood sugar and insulin issues where you feel like you need a dessert or a snack at 11 o'clock at night, it's affecting our circadian clock. It's affecting our ability to get deep sleep and healing sleep where your body detoxes, you download memories, um, you know, your, your thyroid can regenerate and all those types of things. So when you do intermittent fasting and you work within your circadian clock, you give your body enough time in between meals to burn up and utilize the fuel that you're consuming. And then when you turn off your eating time and give your body enough time to prepare for bed, it's so regenerative and supportive for your adrenals, which helps that, especially when there's an underlying thyroid issue. So intermittent fasting is beautiful. Now these longer fasts, I'm going to talk about what's really cool that we're finding right now in studies when it comes to the thyroid is they discovered just recently that we have adult stem cells in the thyroid, which means regenerative capacity, which is a really big deal because if you've lived chronically with, you know, an autoimmune reaction, because the doctor didn't, you know, uh, you know, address it correctly, it destroys your thyroid. So right now studies are like, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? But it's really remarkable to think, we know that fasting, especially longer term fasting affects stem cell, stem cell regeneration and growth. We know it clears out cells. We know it supports you know, healthy mitochondria. Um, we know it changes, it changes your immune system. We know it changes your mi microbiome. It supports good healing microbiome. So longer fasts can be really supportive in healing your thyroid. Even, I know there's a few people on here that don't have a thyroid. Um, it's also supportive in binding and cell health, right? You want to make sure, increase that cell receptor sensitivity so you can bind up these hormones. The only problem is this, I will say this, I'm gonna give this disclaimer. It's all about hormesis, right? We're introducing a stressor, a hormetic stressor that is a stressor, but it's a beneficial stressor. And when it, especially when it comes to your hormones, especially when it comes to thyroid, it's a beneficial stressor until it's no longer is. There's a season to break down and there's a season to build up. If you're chronically in caloric restriction, if you're chronically fasting without adequate refeeding, without that adequate mTOR pathways, without building up, your thyroid will start to adapt to that type of stressor and start to shut down. It will. It would start to conserve energy. It's going to start to change. And the one thing to be aware of what I have found when I'm looking at the studies is that we know that T4 to T3 conversion can go down. But what I found in other studies is we know we have, we have information on 
things like low carb diets because of things like epilepsy and neurological disorders. What they found is with adults that are chronically restrictive, low carb for like 12 months over without any refeeding, without increasing insulin, because insulin increases T4 production in T4 to T3, not only will you see decrease of T3, then you'll see decrease of T4 coming out of the thyroid. And that's what you don't want to see. You don't want to see where the thyroid is not making enough hormones. So refeeding and building up, especially when you're utilizing longer fasts and you're fasting a lot and you're doing caloric restriction, refeeding is really, really important to make sure that thyroid kind of, in a way, kind of wakes up creates these glycogen stores, creates this T4 to T3 conversion, and you're able to get right back into what you were doing before. Yeah, I, I don't want to uh, miss out on hyperthyroidism. I mean, there's obviously there's an autoimmune, like Graves disease and, and things like that, but most people tend to suffer on the hypo side. I think that's far more common, but, but what do you do with hyperthyroidism? Yeah, I, I actually think we are going to see more of hyperthyroidism. I am seeing more people um, with consults after whether it's post-COVID or post-COVID vaccination um, because of the cytokine storm. And so you're right. A lot of the hyperthyroidism, so just so you guys know, you will know hyperthyroidism is going to be more of a 911 state. You're anxious, your, your heart palpitations. I mean, you're going to feel like it's difficulty for you to swallow. In fact, when you kind of have this hyperthyroid happen, hyperthyroidism happen, most people end up in the emergency room. Um, and so I, I want to give a little disclaimer too. So there is hypothyroidism, which is Graves, um, autoimmune toxicity, right? But there's also a possibility that if you've been hypothyroid long enough, your cells can start to die. Your thyroid cells can start to die. And what we find is that when those thyroid cells start to die, they release thyroid hormones. So you have this hyper attack. You go to the emergency room, your thyroid hormones are high. But then when you finally go to your doctor, your thyroid hormones are low. So if you do see a swing, it's more likely that your thyroid cells are dying versus hyperthyroidism. It's this constant state of, um, you know, it's this constant state of having hyper. It revs up everything inside of your body. So with that, in those situations, right away, you have to bring down, I mean, there's a time and a place for certain medications. There's a time and a place for high dosing of certain supplementations that's going to bring down that acute reaction. You don't want to be in that chronic state, right? And then identifying, usually I find, I say this with COVID or COVID vaccination, um, because of viral viruses, reactivation of viruses, um, underlying toxicity, Lyme, mold. That's when you jump into addressing those as soon as possible. But most people in a hyperthyroid state need something temporary to kind of slow down that thyroid, which is different. I'm saying this differently than what, if you go to your doctor, they'll put you on a medication that will just shut down your thyroid. Shut it down, shut it down, shut it down until you eventually need thyroid medication. My goal when I work with people is put them on something supportive to slow down the thyroid so that they can eventually work themselves off of that. Uh, very helpful. Um, let me go back to, uh, you know, the, the, the thyroid obviously affects so many things uh, in our body. Um, and then conversely, so many things affect our thyroid It's a two way street. Yeah. So, you know, we touched a little bit on diet. We touched on a little bit of medication. How do you, you know, how do we, what is a comprehensive way to look at, I mean, it often comes down to getting good sleep, getting exercise, get out in the sun and all that stuff. But how do, is there anything specific and unique to thyroid? Somebody was asking about red light therapy and some of these other things. Are there any things that are kind of unusual that, that have a bigger effect on thyroid than just the general eat healthy and get good sleep type of thing? Yeah, I, I but I'll be completely honest, depending on how long you have thyroid issues, I, I don't even think eating well, getting sunshine is going to be enough because we live in a, we live in a highly toxic world. Like I had a mentor who's straight chiropractor decades ago. He said when he first started practicing, he could adjust someone and they would get better. Oh, they would see all these things. But the longer he practiced, the harder and longer it took. Well, yeah, we live in this chronically, you know, sick environment. 
I will say in regards to red light therapy, I did come across a study um, that looked at the regenerative capacity of red light therapy on the thyroid. And they saw promising um, changes within the thyroid in regards to cell regeneration. So that's something there with that red light therapy. But I, I'll say this, when it comes to the thyroid, uh, you've got to look at it in layers. And the first layer, before you can do anything underlying like detoxification and you know, um, looking at reactivation, I, I always look at the gut. That's the first place I'm going to start. We know within the gut, like I told you, there's going to be this vicious cycle. But a few things that we know can happen with thyroid issues is H. pylori, right? It's a bacteria that burrows into the stomach and it releases systemic toxins while also decreasing HCL production. So before you can jump into toxicity or killing off Lyme or working on that lymphatic, you got to make sure you get this crap out of you. If you don't have normal bowel movements, if you're not sweating, if you're not peeing, like <clears throat> not drinking enough water, right? Like if you are moving things naturally, you're just going to reabsorb those things. So we know H. pylori is going to contribute to that. We know small intestinal bowel overgrowth. So when you have decrease of HCL production, you can see small intestinal bowel overgrowth in candida, which then will cause bloating, which then will cause you know, other systemic issues because they also, really, especially candida, will release systemic toxin. So the first place I look is I want to make sure the gut is well, that there is no gut permeability that's going to keep on flaring up you know, systemic issues. We want to make sure the bile is well. We know toxins bind to fat. You need bile to not just get rid of toxins, but to break down your fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K, um, and to break down your fat from the foods that you're consuming so that your cells can utilize it. You need to make sure that's well and your enzymes are well, right? And then from there, looking at that gut, supporting that gut healing, then nine times out of 10, there's always going to be something deeper for thyroid individuals. We're looking at <clears throat> looking at heavy metals, um, looking at you know looking at iodine, uh, not iodine, um, a heavy metal loading test, looking at viruses. So Epstein Barr viruses, um, cytomegaloviruses, there's strep viruses. And what this means is that you know we all get exposed to viruses throughout our life, especially the monovirus. But the idea is that when your body's chronically stressed, these things can get reactivated. And when these viruses get reactivated, you go about your day without realizing that your body's being trained because it's trying to fight and rebalance from these underlying viruses. Mold, mold is a big one. Mold is a stomach issue. Mold increases antibodies. So a lot of people, you know, my husband was doing a talk earlier this morning and someone was like, well, you know, is there a more cost-effective way if we live in a house that's full of mold? I mean, yeah, you can get an air filter, but mold is a systemic issue that affects brain function, nervous system, spinal cord function, and immune function. So being exposed to that can be really, really difficult. Um, looking at mold, looking at underlying viruses, Lyme disease, um, that's kind of the next step. So first step is, I'll go ahead. And, I'm going to break it down in three steps. First step, see if you need some thyroid hormone support. Some people will need to get on glandulars. I love utilizing, I utilize thyroid glandulars encapsulated. So things like, you know, there's different brands out there and you, you just got to keep an eye on your levels. If you're depleted of T4 and T3, I'll, I'll put them on glandulars. I love using organ meats to support like multivitamin mineral support. Then I'll look at all these labs. Do we need to support vitamin D? Do we need to support vitamin B12? Let's get your minerals up. Then we'll look at the gut, then we'll go deeper. And it's a long-term supportive healing process. Guys, you might have a thyroid issue right now, but it didn't show up right now. We know that antibodies can exist in your body seven to nine years before you see an outside symptom. So it's a peeling back of the layers to go deeper um, in regards to that healing. Uh, there was a question about uh, gut permeability you mentioned, and, and I'm, I'm, I talk a lot about it, about that. How are you assessing gut permeability? I know like there's one group that uses a PEG 400. There's, there's, there's sort of double sugar tests and stuff like that. Are you, are you able to check for gut permeability? So I, I just check for zonulin um, and anti-gliadin. Those are the two that I check right now. And then I go along with symptoms, usually a big red flag, 
always, always there's going to be skin issues. Um, I, I'll also look at food sensitivities either through elimination. This is why I think carnivore can be such a beneficial thing because you're going to eliminate like 99.9% .9 of any possible thing that's causing a flare up. So I like to utilize more of nutritional changes and elimination to see a change in symptoms while we um, support the gut lining. But I, I, I utilize GIMAP, Diagnostic Solutions GIMAP, and then I look at zonulin and anti-gliadin when I'm looking at gut permeability. Yeah, and, and just zonulin is something that our, our gut microbiome can make. We also make it, and it's something that has been shown to disrupt, I guess, the tight junctions. But the anti-gliadin, which many people, the grains, and, and we hear about gluten, but gliadin and stuff. So do you have a problem with grains? Do you find most people have problems with grains as part of the diet? Yes, I do. When I, I mean, there. <laughs> And I've had people do sprouted when I first started practicing. I'm like, okay, well, we'll try if you do sprout or whatever. Um, the idea is that we know that one thing that we, we talk about within the thyroid community is the molecular mimicry, where these molecules look similar to that molecule of the thyroid. So when your body is looking to eliminate these things, it's going to attack the thyroid. But this is the problem. I get asked like, is it the gluten? Yeah, is it the soil that the soil in mono agriculture is depleted of nutrients? Yes. Is it the hybridization that has developed over decades to create an easier wheat product to sell? Yes, it's that. Is it the fact that the way we make bread now is to stay on the shelf? Yes, it's not, it's not at all. You know, bread came about in regards to, you know, a need to you know, a lack of food and a need for this type of food. But what we're exposed to now, this molecule is not at all what it was centuries ago. And every time, I'll tell you this, there's just no way, 90% of hypothyroidism, they're saying is Hashimoto's. I've yet to find one individual that's able to bring down their antibodies without eliminating that. I have not found, and I've worked with thousands of people throughout the years. Yeah, interesting. I guess one, one quick last question, because I know we've gone through an hour and I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, Don was asking about differences between the different thyroid supplements, Armour, Synthroid, and, and I guess Pig Thyroid. What are, the, are there significant major concerning differences? Yeah, let me plug in my computer so we don't die here. Okay, so let me tell you what options are out there, because I'm going to throw in another option to my carnivore group here. So when you go to the doctor, there's synthetic forms, there's synthetic T4, which is Synthroid level thyroxine, and then there's Cytomel, which is T3 only, right? Then there's more natural desiccated thyroid hormone. And for the past decade and a half, I've seen the conversation change, but a lot of doctors will be like, oh, you can't get on Armour Thyroid. Armour Thyroid is pig thyroid, right? Um, you can get on armor thyroid because there's no way to control it if it's coming from a plague glandular, which is completely false. Like you're having just as many recalls on Synthroid than you're having on armor. And remember, you have this backup system, reverse T3. If there's too much T4, your body's going to adapt. If there's a little bit less, it's going to bring in. Now, Synthroid is going to be the number one prescribed medication. They were smart. This pharmaceutical company knew what to do. They came on the market and they prescribe, 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 prescribe. Remember, it's only T4, T4 only. I have a small percentage of people that get on the T4 and they're like, oh, I feel fine. I feel great. And their levels are fine. Cool. That's cool. But a majority of people have issues with converting. So that's why they'll go to armor thyroid, which is the pig thyroid. The problem I have with armor thyroid, it's conventional pig with fillers. You can have corn, you can have gluten, you can have wheat as the fillers. So I've had people that still have symptoms because of even that little amount of filler, because it's every single day that they have to take it. But people tend to feel so much better on armor thyroid because it has T4 and T3. So you have T4 that still needs to be converted, but you have more availability of T3, which is that active thyroid hormone. So people feel really, really good on that. There's also NP thyroid and nature thyroid. I don't know what the heck happened with nature thyroid. That was the most, the cleanest, um, purest 
thyroid medication on the market, but they were, they got, um, they like, uh, they, they went and they, uh, checked everything out and apparently their machinery was behind, which I think is a very interesting thing that the best cleanest form was on back order for a year and a half, but I think they might be back. So nature thyroid tent was, and w, WP thyroid tends to be the cleanest one. Um, and then there's MP thyroid, but armor thyroid is a popular one, but that still has fillers. Another thing that it's real, I want to leave off with two more points. Another thing, depending on what your hormones level are, organ meat, organ meat, nose to tail, organ meat can provide a lot of really great nutrients. Um, it's the original multivitamin, right? And so utilizing thyroid glandular, as long as you're tracking your symptoms, as long as you're doing your lab work, can provide you with amounts of thyroid hormones coming from a very clean source. So there's sources that get their thyroid glandular from New Zealand grass-fed cows with no problematic fillers. There's companies, I think, um, uh, Ancestral Supplements and uh, what's Soladina's, uh, Pure uh, Heart and Soul, that you or something like that. Uh, you can look it up where you can utilize it um, and take these glandulars and it provides thyroid hormones for you. Heck, you can eat thyroid glandulars. Just, if you like eating organ meat, go make yourself some thyroid glandulars and it can be really supportive. But I will say this, one really great, one thing that we have lost in a doctor's office is the art of diagnosing, is the art of listening, right? If you go to your doctor's office, you look at labs and what's on those labs is what you go with. But we know historically doctors would look at not just your symptoms, but your basal body temperature. Basal, you, one of the biggest thing thyroid hormones will do is thermal regulation. And so basal body temperature is when you're laying in bed and before you get up, you take your temperature. You have to be sleeping at least for three hours consecutively, right? You take your temperature. Lower temperatures, usually under 97.5. I tend to find hypothyroid people that are subclinically hypothyroid or really hypothyroid in the 96. Uh, looking at that temperature coupled with how you feel can be a big red flag that your thyroid hormones aren't optimal. So looking at your basal body temperature every single day. And of course, with menstruating women, you're going to see a, a, a spike when you get into your luteal phase. So be aware of that. But oh, every single person I work with is tracking their basal body temperature. They're aware of what's happening with their thermal regulation to make sure they're supporting themselves appropriately. And the last thing I want to add is because I don't have a thyroid. And there's people here that don't have a thyroid. And there's people that are going to listen to this and it, it, it can feel very lonely and lost because all you hear about is people that have thyroid and there are, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands. I mean, right now, a couple of years ago, I looked, it was 70,000 people a year getting their thyroid cut out. That was years ago. I don't know how many now, right? I mean, they're getting it cut out if you have grays, they're getting it cut out if you have a tumor, they're getting it cut out if you have cancer, if you don't have cancer, right? So the one thing to understand is that ranges for people without thyroid is going to be different. We don't have studies on this, right? All you have to go off of is what you're doing, how you feel in your own body. So trust that. That being said, what I have found, this is just for informational purposes, right? What I found for myself and what I found for the people that I've worked with that have, don't have a thyroid is they tend to need to be on the higher end of the range. So if free T3 goes to 4.4, 4.3, 4.4, even 4.5, and they feel amazing. And the reason why this can be complicated is because if all your doctor is looking at is your labs, what will happen is what I hear over and over again is someone will like do a consult with me, right? And they're like, Dr. Becca, I don't get it. I got on higher amounts of thyroid medication and I felt amazing. It was the first time I've had energy. It was the first time I've lost weight. But my doctor looked at my labs and said it was too much and cut back my dose. And now I'm symptomatic again. It should always go according to what you notice differently inside of your body. If you see improvement, you will know if you're on too much medication. You will know. It's the same hyper symptoms. You will know the day of if you're on too much. But for those that don't have a thyroid, a majority of the people I see, they're struggling because they're not on the right dose for them. Let me add, if you don't, if you have a chance, just one other Absolutely. topic. Um, 
iodine, iodine supplementation, because as you mentioned, iodine is inter integral to thyroid hormone production. So how do we manage iodine or how do you manage iodine? Okay, so I, if someone wants to work with iodine, I always recommend um, utilizing um, food sources. I mean, you've got iodine in eggs, liver, cod, shrimp, like you can be aware of consuming foods that have more iodine. I don't like to utilize iodine unless I'm doing two things, um, higher dosages of iodine. Unless I am testing antibodies regularly, I might, if I'm coaching someone, I might test their antibodies every six to eight weeks because I want to see how much this is changing if we're moving in the right direction. And the second thing I will look at is an iodine loading test. We take a higher amount of iodine, then you collect your urine, you see how much you're urinating out over a 24 hour period. The studies find that it's that 24 hour period that your body's going to utilize that iodine. And so if you're peeing out a lot of iodine at the tissue level, your iodine levels are fine. But if you're retaining a lot of that iodine, um, then you would be a, a, a person that would benefit from iodine. Now, iodine is going to be interesting because I don't play around with toxicity. Like I have seen too many people play around with things and they're not getting rid of toxins. We know that higher doses of iodine is going to move out fluoride, chlorine, and bromine. We know it's going to bind to receptors and release these things in your body. So you want to make sure again, that you're not doing higher doses of iodine without making sure you're testing antibodies, you're testing your levels and making sure that your detox pathways are open. Oh, and right, oh, one more thing, oh, selenium. Yeah. I'm gonna talk about minerals just really, really quick because selenium, I came across a study looking at because of how the soil has changed. And I think it was like 50% decrease of mineral content in vegetables, 15% even in meat just because of monoagriculture, especially if you're not getting things from a regenerative farm. And so we know that we're going into this kind of overall issue for a lot of people where our mineral status is low. Minerals are essential, not just for the thyroid, but for so many different systems within the body. But selenium is a part of the glut glutathione peroxidase complex. It is a necessary selenium, zinc, and copper, but especially selenium, it is essential for glutathione production, which will protect your thyroid from free radicals. That will protect your thyroid. It's a potent antioxidant. So selenium is essential to that. So depending on where people are, I can increase selenium or I might work on uh, putting them on a mineral complex um, to make sure that they have adequate selenium levels. It's also associated, I've seen mineral deficiency in decreasing T4 to T3 conversion. Well, okay. Thank you, Dr. Warren. This has been wonderful. I think everybody has gained a lot of insight into this and will give people to think, things to think about, particularly the folks who are struggling with thyroid issues. Um, let folks know where they can go to find out more about you, or maybe you have a social media or a website. Can you share that with us? Absolutely. You can find out more about me at drrebeccawarren.com, my name. I will say I do have a free Optimal Thyroid Labs ebook. I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, it just has the thyroid labs. And in fact, it's really funny. I've worked with enough prescribing doctors that sometimes there's, I want to say this, your doctor doesn't want to do your labs. I get that question all the time. What happens if my doctor doesn't want to do their labs? Don't go to them. Find someone who will, right? Like just, I live in the South. I always hear but my doctor's so nice. And I'm like, yeah, but you're slowly dying. Like, I don't care if he says good morning to you. Like you need to find someone that's going to listen to you and work with you. And then don't expect from your doctor what you can get here. Don't expect if your doctor has a toolbox that they're really good at, which is prescription and ordering labs and surgery. Don't expect them to teach you what it looks like to change your metabolism or how to detox appropriately. Go to them for what they're good at and then invest in this realm of things. So Dr. Rebecca Warren, and then on Instagram, Dr. Rebecca Warren, Facebook, Dr. Rebecca Warren, and I'm about to launch a, a free Facebook group for people that have their thyroid removed called Healing After Thyroidectomy. You should be able to find it on Facebook. Oh, I think you're- Well, okay, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Hopefully maybe we can get you back, back in down the road a little bit if you don't mind. And, uh, yeah. 
Uh, I think everybody had a great time with this. So anyway, enjoy your Monday. And once again, thank you. And the rest of you folks, uh, we'll see, I guess, hopefully most of you guys back tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye now. Join Rivero.Health for a 30-day free trial to get access to live Q&A with VIP guests, social community meetings, member discounts, low-carb healthcare providers list, forum, workouts, monthly challenges, early access to podcasts, recipes, carnivore diet guide, fasting guide, shred guide, and much more.